Right, I want to start with um, the very firm belief that Marx and Engels both had that the rise of industrial capitalism in their day meant the disappearance of the working class family. And I'm going to give you a number of quotations about it. It's because it's a very, it was actually a very firmly held view. So that writing in 1848, Marx, in the Communist Manifesto, said, in its completely developed form, this family exists only amongst the, among the bourgeoisie. But this state of things finds its complement in the practical absence of the family among the proletarians and in public prostitution. The bourgeois claptrap about the family and education, about the hallowed correlation of parent and child, becomes all the more disgusting, the more by the action of modern industry, all family ties among the proletarians are torn asunder, and where children transformed into simple articles of commerce and instruments of, later, uh, of labour. Uh, writing... Um, almost 40 years later, 36 in fact, in The Origin of the Family, Private, private Property in the State, Engels wrote, And now that large-scale industry has taken the wife out of the home, onto the labour market and into the factory, and made her often the breadwinner of the family, the last remnants of male supremacy in the proletarian household are deprived of all foundation, except perhaps for a leftover piece of the brutality towards women, but has become deep-rooted since the introduction of monogamy. And then to flip back to something that very, very important that Engels wrote the con in The Condition of the Working Class in England, he, in 1844, and, and this is from his own observations in, in Manchester, where he, in fact, was um, a factory owner. Um, if the rain... And it's very, very important in terms of understanding a Marxist approach to, 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 to everything but in particular to women's oppression. If the reign of the wife over the husband, as inevitably brought about by the factory system, is inhuman, the pristine role of the husband over the wife must have been inhuman too. If the family of our present society is being thus dissolved, this dissolution merely shows that at bottom, the binding tie of this family was not family affection, but private interest lurking under the cloak of a pretended community of possessions. Now, the reason that they say this again and again and again about the disappearance of the working class family is precisely because of what they saw taking place with the impact of industrial capitalism, because it took the form, initially, of taking what had been the working household dominated by the male in the textile, you know, the putting out system, um, where the weaving and the spinning was actually done in the home, taking that and putting it into factories, in which... Um, the, uh, any notion of a family wage was destroyed wages were pulled down because women, would w uh, women and children were paid less than men and, the, and therefore what Engels describes and you'll find it in, in other people who write about, about the period is you know, you, these huge long working days that uh, what did people do when they, when, they, when they left work well they usually went to the pub or the gin shop and if women were working and Engels describes it, you know, the women would be going to the pub and the men would be at, be at, be at home. And this is what he means about the unsexing of, of, of the woman. If, and then it suddenly occurs to him, well, if, it wasn't, if it's not right for women to be in this dominant position in the pub and the man stuck at home, um, then it can't have been right the other way around either. But the assumption that they made was that the complete pulling in of working class people, children, men and women, would create a form of equality which would lead to which had led to the disappearance of the working class of, of the working class family uh, but as Hannah you know talked about uh, first thing this morning the conditions under which that was happening in terms of child labor in the mines in, in in the factories were so catastrophic that then the whole issue of the reproduction of the working class of the workforce became central from the point of view of the ruling class but also from the point of view um, um, the, the point of view of uh, working class people themselves. So we have to start by saying that, or what I'm going to say, is that Marx and Engels were both right and wrong at the same time. And we have to look at how they were right and we also have to look at the, they were wrong. The first thing is that they were wrong, obviously, that the working class family did not disappear. It was quite consciously reconstituted. Uh, and obviously what therefore follows from that is that women are still unequal to men and women's oppression continues to, to exist. However, what they are right about is a method of approach 
which is that once you draw people into an equal situation in the workplace, capitalism actually, d th th there's a consequence of that, there are huge transformations which, have, um, which, which take place. And I, I really want to start, because really understanding women's oppression is about understanding historical materialism and the, inter and, 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 and the Marxist method. And so I wanted to start from, uh, again, it's in the introduction to the origins of the fam family, private property and the, and the state, which, um, which Engels, Engels wrote. And he starts, he has in his introduction, according to the materialistic conception, the determining factor in history is in the final instance, the production and reproduction of immediate life. On the one side, the production of the means of subsistence, of food, clothing and shelter, and the tools necessary for that production. On the other side, the production of human beings themselves, the, pro the propagation of the species. And what he then goes on to document in, in his analysis is that for the overwhelming majority of human history, and it depends whether you start like Duncan Hollis used to do about dating it back about one and a half million years to two million years when you know, people first walked on two legs, or whether you date it to modern Homo sapiens sapiens, which is only, only a quarter of a million years ago, that throughout that entire period, production and reproduction happened together inside, inside you know, small groups, roughly reckoned to be no more about 50, within which the reason we had egalitarian relationships between men and women was simply because the seeking and finding of food foraging was as important as the getting of meat or fish and also that hunting developed depended on very much very often on the intelligence gathering of the women by the women when they were out foraging of where the food was the equal weight of the contribution of both sexes to the ability of the band to survive meant that both paid an equal role inside society first thing secondly because it was a small group that therefore the question of children it was a generational thing you know one generation brought up the next generation and it didn't you know there wasn't any question oh well that's your son that's your daughter therefore you deal with them there were social rules for the running of of, of, of a very small society everybody had to to stick by them and, and therefore everybody made sure that ever, everybody everybody else did and that was the majority of that question of cooperation and equality um, um, which we have you know, there are indications that within that, that certainly in certain societies, people could actually choose their gender role. If somebody wanted to be a woman, but are actually biologically a man, or wanted to play the role of a, a man and were biologically a woman, that there was that flexibility, certainly in certain societies that, that uh, we know about that survived into, into the 19th and 20th centuries. Now, so the the transformation of that the key to understanding that is actually what happens with the means of production the development of the means of the means of production and therefore what i want to flip to now is to talk about really the way in which capitalism as you know marx again talks about in the communist manifesto is constantly revolutionizing itself and in the processes are therefore constantly revolutionizing the superstructure of society and therefore what the, the, the way in which the family is shaped, the way in which personal relations are shaped. So I want to start with what we take for granted, but actually is, it is, happened really only um, 200 years ago, is you have the complete separation of work and home. When people go out to factories, go out to workplaces, they are no longer working inside the home in terms, of, in terms of paid work. They are dependent on paid work in order to survive. They have to go out to it. They have to travel to it. And that's, a, that's the first thing. The second thing is it therefore puts them in big groups of, of people where there aren't necessarily, and increasingly over time, there aren't necessarily any kind of family relations between the people who, who you work with. That you, you know, you'll be working with people that you aren't genetically related, related to. Um, thirdly, Increasingly, people were working in large populations in towns and in, uh, in cities. And um, as I've said, they were also dependent on, on, um, on paid labour. And what is the consequence of this? It's massive. It means that the question of, in, in the media, the authority of the man in the household is actually undermined because he's no longer directing the labour of the women and children inside the, inside the household. His authority actually simply depends on the fact that he can sell his labour power. And if women are selling their labour power as well, then it actually be, begins to bring a, a parity into, into the situation. 
So um, it has it 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 actually had that effect. And at the time, as I say, when Marx and Engels were writing, what they saw is everybody being sucked into it, and therefore egalitarian. Um, a complete transformation in relations happening between men and women and also also children at uh, at the time. But also in this period, as um, uh, my partner's just been doing some research on uh, on the area around Bow Church. And if you go back to the late part of the 19th century, there were two music halls. Um, there was uh, um, a cinema the old style, and the, there were a whole series of the far more pubs than, that there are, than there are now. And if you actually think about the Match Girls factory, which is just around the corner from that area, you think about people leaving work, the kind of socialisation that could take place if they could go to all those different kinds of things. People can socialise on a big scale with a whole variety of different people, therefore opening up a social space which doesn't exist inside a small, in a small village. In other words, you can begin to develop relationships of all sorts of different kinds with the, you know, with the, with the opposite sex, with the same sex, um, in the context of, of, of that kind of social life beginning to, be, beginning to be provided. And therefore, I think we have to introduce into it the, the sheer impact of living in towns and that different kinds of uh, socialisation being enormously important in terms of in, in, in terms of um, uh, the, what the family looks like today. Now, as, as Hannah said um, um, today, the reason that the working class family got, became reconstituted was the death rates increased massively um, and people's lifestyles actually began to, began to decline because people just can't live at that, you know, that with the rate of exportation under those sorts of conditions. And therefore, if you think about it, for, I mean, from the point of view of the ruling class, they had to make sure that the, 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 you know, that the working class reproduces itself, you know, is housed, clothed, fed, watered, um, and, and, and taken care of. Now, in the defeat of the Chartist movement, which, you know, put paid to any real, you know, working class movement for the transformation of society, the, any kind of push to socialise um, all of these tasks is out the window and therefore the notion of reproducing a family of creating a nuclear family where individuals men biological fathers and mothers have to take res responsibility for the reproduction of themselves and of the next generation is uh, is what is, is what the the drive was and so the working class family becomes reconstituted and in terms of Working class people themselves, there's two aspects to it, isn't there? There is the fact that actually if one out of the two can stay at home and actually do the cleaning and do the cooking and, you know, make the place decent, it means your quality of life for both of you rises because actually living in a clean, decent place is better than living in the kind of shitholes um, all of the time. Secondly, it does also mean in terms of taking care of your children, instead of having to take babies into the factory and su suckle them there, then actually you can, you can actually look after your children, you can develop some sort of relationships with, 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 with your children. It is double-edged. But the problem is, it, of course, as soon as women get withdrawn out of the workplace, they lose their economic power and therefore their social weight inside society and become subordinate to, uh, to men inside the family. And you get a division of labour emerging, you know, where the woman's place is in the home and the man's place is, is going out in society. And although women... It, there, are, there were always women who continued to go out to work in, in one form or another. Never that pattern was re recreated in, in the latter part of the, the, the 19th century, but it was not an easy task. The ruling class, if you think of what they had to do, they had to pass a battery of laws about, um, about marriage. They had, to, about, they had to regulate sexuality by introducing the first laws about, about buggery and outlawing male... Um, sexual acts with other men, um, both in private and, and in public. They had to introduce the poor, the, the, you know, the poor laws were introduced and they introduced the work, uh, you know, the workhouse. I mean, there's no, you know, the ba they weren't called the Bastille for nothing. Where, you know, because men went to one side and women went to the other side, they weren't allowed to meet. So it's a complete, you know, if you don't play by the system, folks, then we're going to smash your lives up, 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 uh, up completely. And therefore, the, so the whole battery of the state was then imposed on and, and all the laws about prostitution. So when Marx and Engels talk about, you know, you have the family on the one hand and prostitution on the other, you know, those two always go, those two things always go hand, hand in hand. Now, so that, that, that emerged through the end of the, the 19th century and the beginning of the, um, of, of the 20th century. 
But again, one of the things that massively undermined it was the, was, was the question of war. If you go for world wars, which is what happened in the First World War and the Second World War, particularly in the Second World War, once you go for a, a world war and, you send all, you, and it, you know, you're sending all your men out to fight, then somebody actually has to produce the guns. And therefore, who was going to produce the guns? It was the women. So women got massively drawn into the workforce and therefore they reversed all the arguments. Instead of a woman, you know, the, the key place was being in the home, the key place is being in the factory because they have to produce some munitions. And so they're quite capable of transforming the rhetoric about what a woman's role should be according to the needs of, the, uh, the needs of, of, of capitalism at the time. And so throughout, you know, through the period, really through the 30s and 40s and, 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 and the war, we saw the undermining of the, the working class family beginning to take place through the drawing of women into the workforce with a blip in the 50s when they tried to push it right back into the home again at the end of the, the Second World War. Until the massive expansion, the huge expansion in, uh, um, after the Second World War, you know, when you get, you get the, the, the glory... Uh, when you get the um, you've never had it so good um, by Macmillan with you know the 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 twenty year boom after the Second World War, you, you think you have the massive expansion of public sector with education, the health service, and all the other services provided in uh, providing society. Who gets sucked in to do all of that? Actually, it's immigrant labour, the drawing in of people from the old colonies, and also women being drawn out of the home to to, to do all those uh, do all, do all those. Uh, to do all those jobs, so that now we have the situation where we have fifty percent of the workforce which is which is made up of women, and increasingly you know, it 's quite clear that women are a permanent part of the a permanent part of the the workforce with married women going back to work sooner and sooner after the birth of their children so that 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 transformation in the, by the needs of capitalism in drawing women back into the workforce again. However, is supplemented by a number of other things which are very, very important, I think, for us to understand what is going. The second thing after the Second World War was a huge expansion of secondary, uh, was of tertiary edu education. Because, in fact, comes, and we saw it in South Africa a bit later in terms of what, the, what kind of workforce they need. Once you move to this huge welfare state at the, and the transformation of the kind of jobs which are needed, you needed a literate workforce. And therefore, you need, to edu you need to educate them. So we'd already had schooling introduced at the end of the 19th century. And steadily over, this, over the, 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 the 20th century and into the 21st century, we've had this, this school age being extended. So people had to you know, go to school for longer and longer. And then we wanted them to go to university because actually the ruling class depends on people who can read, write, count, and also use computer technology and all the rest of it. And they have to be trained for that. And therefore, it takes a long time to do it. So we create childhood and adolescence. And now what is childhood and adolescence about? It's actually very interesting. It means from a roughly age five, six or so, we throw little ones growing up for the next, you know, 15 odd years in institutions which are made up of loads of other people of, you know, uh, roughly the same age of their peers, but other people round about them. And what do they do when they're there? Well, actually, an awful lot of kids will tell you the reason they go to school is because they're mates. In other words, you, so capitalist society has actually created institutions which create friendships, where people actually learn to play together, to study together, to cooperate together, and you know, have a go at the teachers together and whatever else together. Um, and it creates a completely new d d set, of, set of potential rela relationships which are much, much more egalitarian because you're in a classroom together, actually you're in roughly the same sort of uh, position in, 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 in the thing. And that... I, that, and I think that is very important in terms of when we think about the changes to um, sexuality and so forth, I'll come on to that in a, in a, in a second. So we have this massive expansion of, of secondary ed education and, and university education. At the same time, we also have transformations of the ability to control reproduction. So all that, this is happening after the Second World War and, it, and as a consequence of the clash between... <coughs> The reality of people's lives and the ideology and the inegalitarian situations that existed in places like Ireland, in the Deep South, in the United States, the wars that, you know, the, the war in Vietnam and so on and so forth. And you get this huge eruption in the 1960s, which spawns both the, you know, all the movements against, uh, against oppression, the women's liberation movement, the gay liberation movement, the national liberation struggles, it's all kicking off all at the same time. And underpinning it in a place like, in a place like Britain, 
more so than in, 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 in the United States, is um, a working class movement, which is actually also beginning to fight, uh, to, fight, to, 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 to fight back, which means that you get an articulation of liberation for women in the form of socialising the family, because all the demands for the right of control over our own bodies is controlling your own sexuality, the right to um, have crushes, the right to... Um, uh, all the, the right to equality, equal pay, no sex, uh, sex discrimination and so forth contain elements of socialisation of the family, elements of controlling your own body and elements of equality inside, inside real society. Now, that, that is what la laid the foundations then for, for the situation that we, um, that, that we, that we face today because um, it, it laid the basis for the emergence of the single, single parent family because... From the, from the, once you have that breaking open of the thing in the 1960s with women going out to work, do you have to carry on living with somebody you don't get on with? Well, no, actually you don't. So the possibilities of divorce, living separately, and the single parent family actually emerge in, 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 in this kind of period. And that opens, opens up a huge um, personal space for people, even though we know that um, single parent families are much, much poorer than dual parent families. Um, secondly, all of this, I think, has a, has a massive um, impact in terms of the potential for same-sex relationships. You know, that was, that was fought for by the gay liberation movement actually then becomes realisable because in, when you're growing up with people in, in school, despite all the prejudices, you are getting to know people of the same sex and different sexes. It creates, and when you're going out to work or even when you're going to university, Towns are sufficiently anonymous places to begin to provide venues and potentialities for people to realise a different kind of sexuality and where people can be one thing one minute, another thing another minute and experiment and, 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 and so on and so forth. So that, all of that actually emerges as a, as a consequence of this. Now, the other th thing which is hugely important, however, and which I think is, is, is that from the beginning of the 20th century, you actually begin to see the huge commodification of family life. It starts, it, it starts off with the production of food. Well, it doesn't necessarily start off with production of food, but actually everything which is done in the home, and I'm going to start off differently. I'm going to start when you get up in the morning and if you, you, know, you go and have a shower, then you're, the product you use to wash yourself with you know, is mass produced. Um, what you dry yourself with is mass produced. The deodorant you use is mass produced. Whether you put makeup on is, you know, is mass produced. The clothes that you wear and the kind of clothes you wear are mass produced. The whole, you know, then what you go and have in your fridge is mass produced. Uh, the whole lot is mass produced. And not only is it mass produced, it is sold to you. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's much better to use this. It, you should be using a deodorant. If you're not you're using a deodorant, there's something the matter with you. And you should be wearing this underwear or that underwear. You should be using these colours or that colours. You should have this kind of makeup on or not makeup on. You should be looking like this or not looking like that. The entire commodification of what takes place inside the family, inside the family home, is absolute. It is absolute in the way that I never dreamed of even, you know, even 30, even 30, even 30 years ago. So that, you think about, I mean, and it is, it's massive the impact about it. The, because we have a, this contradictory process taking place where the image which is presented to young women and also to young men, but less so, but to young women is you're supposed to look, you know, really kind of sleek, aren't you? And absolutely gorgeous. And, you know, your body shape is supposed to be, I'm not quite sure what it's like. It, what, <laughs> but you're supposed to have a particular kind of body shape. And, it, and you have to have skin of a particular, you, that looks in a particular, particular kind of way and, and all the rest of it. And what is actually happening inside inside society at the moment is that actually people's bodies are going like this and why is it people's going the bodies like are going like that when actually the image is that you should be going like this and it's because the drinks that people drink today are sh you look at the sugar content and that's the sugar industry that's why people's you know youngsters bodies are expanding you walk down the street and you look at people and you compare it with what pe the people's body sizes 30 years ago it's the sugary drinks that are the main 
it's still there. What is it? It's the food that people eat because it's mass produced. What's it full of? It's full of salt and preservatives, and you know the the good stuff of good food is taken out of it. Why did they do that to us? Because they really don't care what we shovel down their throats. And you know, 1844 when Engels was writing, they didn't care either. They put chalk in people's foods instead of, you know, proper ingredients and 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 and, and, and stuff like that. And so that the 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 extent to which we are literally physically being shaped and uh, in terms of the way we are being rep reproduced is absolutely is is really absolutely extraordinary extraordinary and therefore one aspect of that which you know people have talked around uh, about already is the way in which sexuality has been taken over and divorced from us as um, as human beings and is actually something which is projected back to us which you either you sell your body, or you go and uh, you go and take uh, take somebody's body. Is 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 a part and parcel of a continuum of that happening to to us in terms of our in terms of our totality. So, because I've got to stop, I just want to I want to finish on this. Where does this leave us? The key thing I think we actually have to understand is that um, although potentially capitalism could socialise the functions of the family they came very close to doing lots of that in the second world war when they needed women massively inside the workplace current conditions inside um inside capitalism with crisis that ain't going to happen so reproduction of ourselves and the next generation is going to happen continue to happen on a privatized basis and if it's not the responsibility of two people it's going to be the responsibility of one person because you know we we haven't got small collectives that actually can take on that on, and therefore the nuclear family with one pe person in it or two people in it is actually going to continue. So, what is going to happen as a consequence of that, in terms of where we're at, in terms of the the impact of the crisis? Now, it's very difficult when you're actually living through something to see what is happening. So, I, I, we just have to look out for trends, and people have talked about some of them already. We know that because the majority of cuts in jobs are happening in the public sector, where the majority of women work, it'll have a dis it's having a disproportionate impact on women. It's not because they're women, it's because of that's the jobs that women are in. Because you go back to the 1980s and the crisis, when mines were being closed and engineering factories were being closed, it weren't, wasn't women who were being chucked on the, on the scrap heap, it was mainly men who were being chucked on the scrap heap. So I think it's important for us to understand that. Secondly, what people have already said is that the kinds of things, services provided by all those public services will disproportionately impact on, uh, on, on, on women at the centre of the working class family because it is precisely all those um, services of providing the 101 different things which actually support the reproduction of the working class which are, which are being cut. Thirdly, we know that the cuts in benefits will have a disproportionate impact. Fourthly, housing. If one of the things which is absolutely central to people's lives is if you can't stand where you live, you've got somewhere else to live. You can't stand the person you're living with, whether you're a, whether you're a young ad adolescent or whether you're a man or a woman in a household, the quite, where are you going to bloody well live? If you want to move out of a relationship, that is the actual central question. Where do you go? Do you go to the you know Do you go to a bridge over the Thames or, or where, where, whatever town you live in? Or a, or a street corner, or is actually physically somewhere else to live. And the fact that the housing crisis is growing by the day actually will push people. And, and, and we know it, if, if men become un unemployed, where they tend to go onto the streets. Youngsters that end up on, on, on the streets as well. But that housing pressure, will, that housing crisis will actually increase the pressure on, uh, on working class families absolutely massively. And therefore, it will create the pressure to take care of, to keep people together, even though they don't want to, get out in horrible circumstances if they can't stand it. The sense of guilt that I ought to be looking after granny or so-and-so or so-and-so inside, inside the family, but I can't, we haven't got the space, we can't do it, can't work and juggle all the things, therefore you simply feel guilt about it. So the guilt will increase because people don't want to let, pe people don't want to drop people in it. You might actually hate your grandfather or your grandmother or your mum or your dad or whatever because you've got had lousy relationships with them, but you don't want to see them in the gutter. Most people do not want to see either their children or their other relatives in, in, um, in, in, in the gutter. And, and so all of those economic pressures will actually compound the it pressures on, in, on, on, on relationships inside, 
in, uh, in, in, in inside inside the family. However, uh, the mole of history continues to borrow. And, and therefore, what is hugely important for us is that as revolutionaries, we do focus on where we are strong, on the collective, on where we can actually get movements of struggle going, whatever the issues are, where we can collectivise, where we can fight. That always lifts the pressure on people. It always makes people feel better. It always is the motor of actually changing people's confidence in themselves and therefore, uh, and therefore ideas. And it's also the means by which we create a movement which is capable, you know, of transforming society and laying the conditions where Marx and Engels will be proved completely right. You know, the, the, the working class family as we know it today will actually disappear or will create something much better in its place. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you, Sheila, for that introduction. We've now got about half an hour for any questions and discussion so I don't know if people want to start with any questions they have to Sheila and obviously everyone feel welcome to come back on someone else's question um, I, just, I think that the question of the family is really difficult to raise beyond these kind of meetings because people feel obviously very defensive about their families and passionate about it and I think it's quite um, I don't know if kind of interested to know but I think it's actually quite difficult to say that the family is a problem, um, and actually, you know, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because because it's where people live, and it's the uh, people they love, and and what have you. And I and I also think that it's almost there. There was something is two separate points really, but there's something that came out of the movement in the past, which was that you could challenge capitalism by creating some kind of alternative family. And I just think there's a whole lot of things that we have to say. Like, I was really interested in Hannah's statistic that 50% of people now claim they don't live in a conventional family. I think it's really important to say that. Because, you know, there was a time when to have a child out of wedlock was more or less impossible, for example, mm. or as it was phrased <laughs> in those days, or whatever, you know, or, or, or being gay, or having, even now, you know, the idea that gay people can get married. I mean, what is the problem, Christ's sake? The, the, you know, the, the whole the whole thing it's just going on isn't it all the time but I just but I think we have to simultaneously say we totally defend those things we totally live in those things but on the other hand we're not you, it's not a moral question it's not a lifestyle question that you can find some kind of niche inside of capitalism which is an alternative family if you like much as you have the right to do that it isn't the end of the family or the end of sexism and I, I would like some comments on how, how in, in reality, when we have to win at, be with and against people as we are in, in movements and in united fronts, how you raise the question of the family without sounding like you're just kind of saying it's just this terrible, terrible thing, even though we know that terrible things can happen. Yeah. I mean, I think that there's this real contradiction now, or you know, one of the contradictions around the family, is on the one hand there's all the privatisation, there's all the pushing the stuff back onto the family, there's the fact that there's all the caring goes on there, so it's hugely important for the ruling class that it continues as an institution. But I think things have changed in that sexuality that was seen, uh, well, I mean, sexuality, sex for pleasure as a whole, I think, say, in the Victorian period, was seen as something that undermined, potentially, the family, and as mm -hmm. Sheila said, therefore, you see the attacks um, on same-sex relationships and the attacks on prostitution and so forth. I think things have sort of shifted quite a lot over the last 50 years. I think sexual pleasure is now, I mean, for example, with the availability of fairly reliable contraception, for a lot of people, sex has become something which is about pleasure and not about reproduction. I, I, I mean, I suspect that the lives of straight women have, 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 have been the group's most changed um, by that. And so I think that for the ruling class, the attitude that they have to the family, it, 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 it now includes sexuality. Sexuality is seen as a good thing if it, if, if it supports the family, because mm. the reason why people are in these relationships which form the core of the family um, is, that the, it, it is, is that they get pleasure from the relationship, including um, in including sexual pleasure. So I think you have this contradiction where you have some Tories like Anne Whittaker um, are you know are, are, are you know plain old fashioned bigots, um, and then you have people you know like David Cameron, whose approach to LGBT people is to invite us into the family. 
um, and to reinforce the family by saying, well, look, now we're going to let gay people get married, and then, um, you know, and so you can join. And, 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 you know, to come back to the question about what do we have to say about the family, well, I think, you know, you can understand why people, you know, why some people, you know, but, um, you know why people who are in long-term relationships, either for practical reasons, you know, for example, at the moment, I understand that if you're a teacher, you can only inherit your partner's pension if you're married to them for the sake of immigration, for the sake of various practical reasons, mm. but also for the sake of the, of, of, the, of the fear that people have that they will end up lonely and isolated. You know, people want, um, you know, people want to do what they can to ensure uh, that, um, you know, that, that, that they won't end up in that situation. But when you look, for example, at the incredible sums of money that people spend on weddings, you know, tens of thousands of pounds, typically, that people spend on weddings because they want to make this investment, you know, almost literally an investment into their relationship to show how seriously they take it. And the unfortunate thing is that we know that that really doesn't work. Um, you know, we know that all of the kind of pressure that people are under, and maybe, and, and you know, maybe the best thing is that the relationship doesn't last forever anyway. So, um, you know, so I think, well, I mean, that is a serious point because I mean, people sometimes talk as if, you know, being married for 60 or 70 years is the best thing you can do. And, you know, maybe really it isn't. Um, you know, so, I mean, I think that, you know, so, I mean, it isn't as if we're saying, you know, that, that we want to break up the family in the sense that, you know, that in, in the sense that we don't have any sympathy. I think, you know, I I think that everybody's trying, you know, to live their lives as best they can and making difficult choices. And I think it's really a question of people having more choices. Um, and, you know, with the, you know, with the rise of the gay movement, with contraception, people have some more choices than they used to, but I think people are still horribly constrained. Mm. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah, so I don't have a particular contribution. <coughs> There's just two topics that I want to ask uh, questions on. Um, the first one, maybe isn't really too relevant to today it's just there's kind of like two gaps in my understanding of kind of like historical materialism because I went to uh, the meeting by Jess Edwards earlier uh, which was on like the roots of women's oppression and we talked about how you know there used to be generally like nomadic tribes and there was kind of like egalitarian style, style of living but she said that after nomads settled um, like production became privatized so you got this kind of like nuclear family going on and like, I didn't really understand why that was if you give if you give some explanation on that that would be good and then also how did because presumably this kind of like the kind of private production must have became dominated by certain groups or basically how did this kind of create the condition for feudalism to arrive uh, to arise after that and then on a completely different topic uh, I was in a feminist uh, society meeting at my university the other day and uh, Sweden kept being upheld as, as this, you know, model of the way that you know capitalism can work for women. And um, like, what is what is the best way to, to counter that argument? So, Thank you. Right. Um, I think when we're talking about family, we should uh, make a distinction between a bourgeois family and family in general. Like, what we argue against is a family with hierarchy, with you know, mainly the father, both of them the being in control and, 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 and the parent suppressing the, the, the children or the wife being suppressed by the, by the, the father. I'm, I'm part of like, the sporting movement and I live in quite a few different communes um, and it's, it's weird to see that every time I live in a commune as a third it's a fr family. But I think it's got a depth and what people, when you criticise family, they don't see it as just the way that we're seeing the bourgeois family. They see it as something that is, um, when you're collectively looking after yourself, you're going out getting food, looking after shelter and so forth. So that's something that we should say. We, we like the family, it's just we don't like the hierarchy, the, the slavery that comes with the bourgeois family under this, under this system. And actually having... Um, a group of people of different ages, different sets, different work backgrounds, and that in an, in a in a group, and you know supporting each other and, and teaching each other is actually is a good thing. Not saying that this is the solution to capitalism, but the you know having that after capitalism now is also also a good thing. Um, and then that goes on to the schools and so forth. I don't think schools are necessarily a good space for collectivisation of children. It actually splits up ages. Like, so actually most children that come out of school are actually scared of older people. You know, they can't talk to an old man. I remember those of my mates introducing them to older comrades and that. 
and they're like 16 and meeting some guy that's 70 and they always think they're a dirty old man you know um, they, they, it, I'm not, I'm not just not abstracting this sort of happened I had to break through the, the age gap and I think this is because at school they don't experience the only people that experience are older than the teachers and you're meant to look at them in some sort of they, they know everything but you can't be a mate with them you can't relate with them that's I think schools are actually one of the things that split up uh, the collectivisation rather than collectivising. Yeah, uh, to come back to that question about how you talk to people about the family without seeming to be attacking them for living <coughs> in one as they are, uh, I think we have to remember that the description of the family is a haven and a hell. And if you think, I mean, I always think about prisons, and I imagine it's the same thing Bali and Eve. You know, the whole family comes together. But it's quite interesting that at Christmas, murder rates go up within the family. <laughs> <laughs> and suicide rates go up for people who haven't got a family to be in for Christmas. Mm. And I think that really expresses a lot. But when you're talking about family, you talk about, if you talk about the incredible value it has for the ruling class. I mean, the report the other day about um, how a lot of old people who get home care are being neglected, being left in the dark, being left in filthy cheats, this kind of thing. Uh, those are older people living on their own at home. You get the same sort of reports about older people in hospital or in residential care. And the only defence that we actually have while the health service is being attacked and cut back and uh, health and social care is actually if there are members of the family to go in and keep an eye on these people and make mm. all good friends to get protected. And the family is socialising the children, feeding the children, trying to defend the children against the, the kind of filth that's put into food that Sheila was talking about, trying to make sure they're happy against all the odds, forcing them to school, sometimes against your will, having that guilt, you know, somebody put on Facebook yesterday, what do you do if your child's ill? Stay away from work, and feel guilty about missing day at work, dose them up and send them into school, and feel guilty all day while you're at work, waiting for that terrible call from the school because your kid's not well. You know, the way in which guilt has been exploited, Sheila mentioned it, throughout, and, because, and that burden of guilt has been put on women. I was thinking at the earlier meeting about the new sexism, um, somebody said it's actually the old sexist ideas repackaged. We're made to feel guilty and insecure about a whole new range of things because capitalism can make a profit out of it. They make use of us, exploit us as nursery school, hospital and old people's home. And at the same time, they exploit us economically by exploiting our insecurity about how we look, about whether we're healthy or unhealthy. I mean, gyms, they, to, you know, they make massive amounts of money about people's insecurity, about their fitness. You're made obese by the junk food, and then you go to the gym to get rid of it. You've got all this kind of pressure on you all the time, and all the time they make money out of it. But I'll tell you one thing that I think, that part of it is to do with the crisis of capitalism. Capitalism is actually much weaker at the present time. And the weaker it gets, the more it tries to find new ways to exploit us. You know, when I was young, you said, they'll be selling water to us before you know what's happening. No, it's unthinkable. Now the books say, if they could bottle the air and sell it to us. It won't be long unless we do what we're supposed to get, get like and fight back against it. But I don't think you should worry about that. You're you're not attacking individuals for seeking to make that haven for the people <coughs> that they care about. There is nothing wrong with that. But we have to recognise the hell side of it and recognise fantastically valuable to the ruling class the family is and how it does structure the kind of jobs that people take take on and the way in which those jobs are remunerated and all those other things that don't really family under capitalism. Thank you. Uh, Anna. 
uh, Michael Poo and SWP Coventry. I'm just, I don't know, I've, it's a funny thing about uh, kind of contradiction of families and stuff. Uh, I was one of the uh, kind of cohort that was made redundant by Thatcher when she took on the industrial working class and I was in engineering and in factories and things. And my dad used to bring up a wage and kept all the family. We lived in the Kansas state, it was kind of white working class state, pretty stable. And the kind of contradiction I find is that Thatcher came in and uh, she brought in this kind of the conservative part, part of family values that are done, yet the policies they implemented actually destroyed the family, destroyed, destroyed working class communities mm-hmm. like you see in Yorkshire and places like that, and uh, the North East, especially the steel industry and things. And the, uh, the, the actual consequence and the degradation, the, uh, kind of the consequences of those actions, those policies, is all around if you just see. It's like, it's terrible, you know. Uh, there's no the children grow up uh, most of the parents were unemployed we saw that film kind of a, a, a parody I suppose but the the, uh, the mind the, uh, the still works in Sheffield the full Monty and stuff it's kind of hard to watch that without I don't sort of laugh I, I find it it's kind of tragic comic you know, tragic comic but the kind of thing about capitalism I've been learning is like you know it's kind of all about the family and I'm trying to stay on the subject of the family I mean, those working class communities did have a stability with the working men's club and stuff. But I know we were sexist and homophobic as well, and racist. And so there's that kind of contradiction. In the working class communities there, you'd have like, you'd be working next to a black guy, and you know, and you'd, and you'd go down and have a drink together. The next thing you'd be sitting down talking to these black bees and stuff. And it's kind of a contradiction. The working class kind of it's fragmentation, I suppose, happens, does it? But I'm, I won't go on too long. But I'm just sort of thinking now, this new attack that's going on. With, you made a good point about the it was, it was, it was those that thrown out work in the 80s now it's, it's not women being attacked but it's women in public sector jobs and this public sector jobs going to be outsourced we've got secure, secure, security security test 4 and circle all these firms sniffing around and uh, trying to get these contracts in the schools and the police etc and we know what's going to happen and we heard the news today about the public sector's too were too, get more, too well paid and they want to make private sector more competitive but you know they could just bring the wages up so it's going to force wages mm-hmm. down it's like a neoliberal attack and the way I sort of see it if this neoliberal attack, neoliberal attack is on do you going to do the same thing to families again because like you know in America you've got three or four people you've got people working but living in, in drains or living under mm-hmm. subways and they're actually working with two jobs but the jobs pay so low so this neoliberal attack is going to force wages down and I don't know how the families operate, and I made a point earlier on about, if you look back to Victorian times, that's what you said about the workhouse, uh, families were separated and, and we, we had lots of prostitution and things, and I'm just thinking now, we look into a situation in the future maybe where we'll have an increase in prisons, a more coercive state, a more bureaucratic co- coercive state, and kind of more kind of blame culture, you know, blaming people, <laughs> like you know, the other, you know, the outside or whatever, I can't think of the right word to say. But the last point is that I think now we I think the struggle will become very bitter, and once people start seeing the connections, what's going on they, when they're at work and they've been attacked on their pensions, they start seeing it's a part of a wider attack, and I think the position the the the, the, the struggle is going to become more bitter, and people have to start taking up positions. And the last thing I want to say is like because like ne- neoliberalism is a is a is a free flow of capital, and it's it's like capital can move and these these companies can do what they want to how much power do we have in, in, a, in a country and what is the kind of position for internationalism of because these things are happening to other countries Greece and European I think the working class people have to like get together you know somehow I don't know how but we have to have internationalism we have to look like, that's the only way we're going to fight this uh, neoliberal attack is by solidarity with all these countries and techno- that's basically well, thanks thank you mm-hmm. Yes. At the back. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I was trying to come back to this thing about the um, private sphere, the pro- public and private sphere question that the woman next to me raised about um, um, how, how those things happen. <clears throat> and I think um, at the beginning of the talk last week as well, was like one of the things that Sheila raised as well was around the an attempt to understand society through looking at the ways in which we not only reproduce ourselves as a species, as a, as a being, but also how we secure for ourselves the means of production, how we secure for ourselves the food, the housing, all those things every day that make up our lives and, help, and, and keep us going. And I think that, you know, obviously with people have heard reference to primitive communist societies <laughs> and then and looked at how familial stru- structures were, were shaped 
by, by those by those societies, by the fact that you had the hunter-gatherer sort of society and so on, that you had a small group society, that you didn't therefore have um, <clears throat> the same constrictions around familial ties that we see today. And then we sort of move almost rapidly through, you know, I mean, that's a vast part of human history. And we move through the development of class society. You look at the rise of the family and industrial, and industrial capitalism, and I think it sort of helps to show a little bit more about the separation of the sphere, the private sphere of reproduction and the public sphere of production. Because when you think about when people existed in societies which were much more agriculturally based, you can see how both the home environment, where you lived and where you produced your economic sense of economic uh, well-being be was the same place, effectively. The same place you brought up the children was the same place that you went out to work. The, the ties between the two things, the, the relationship between how you produce and how you reproduce, you, you can really see it. I mean, even if you go now, so I spent a long time in India, I spent about 10 months in India, and <clears throat> there you have a country with combined and uneven development. So you have both an incredible industrial working class, but you can go through parts of, of India that are still shaped massively by agriculture, and you can see the relationship between the home, between the division of labour, between the way in which men and women operate, and how they work the land around them. When you start to see, for example, in the UK, you had the enclosures, you had rapid industrialisation as well that took place through the 1800s, you see the ripping up of people from those home um, units, from the units where they produce things, being dragged into towns and being separated, and therefore you start to see the separation of where you go to work and where you secure for yourself the means to survive is a different place to where you reproduce the next generation of labour and so on. And so the alienating experience of working for somebody else under wage labour, the alienating experience of being ripped out of those sorts of familial sort of arrangements and so on, I think was what put the pressure on the, the nuclear family, it, it puts the pressure on that Sarah described of the haven and the hell at the same time, because being so alienated, seeking sort of love and to be cared for and so on, I think puts huge pressure on the family, which also makes it a restrictive unit at the same time. But what I'm essentially trying to say is, is that the alienated experience of, um, of being a worker under capitalism is what shapes the family, it's what shapes the alienating experience of your home life at the same time and makes it such a, contra such a contradictory thing. Um, so I think in order for us to understand how to break it, we have to, you can, once you can tie up the rise in private property, the rise in, in industrial capitalism, and the ideological, social and economic need for the family, you can start to see how it's, the, it's also the class society that can start to break that. because. What we've also created, what capitalism has also created, is a situation in which people now have a better opportunity than they've ever had before to collectively organise to smash class society. The, the way in which production has been shaped under capitalism, it means it's created its own grave digger. It's created the situation in which for working class people, the only way to fight back and the only way for them to reshape their lives is to do it collectively, to do it together and to do it as a class. And I think when people start to really challenge the alienating experience of, of, of work, when they start to challenge the power of those above them to rule them, when they start to challenge whether or not their role in life is always to be that worker, then they start to challenge not just their economic selves, but they start to challenge the whole social and ideological nature of the organisation of society around them. And that's when I think we can start to break down the nuclear family. We won't break familial ties because they're an essential part of human reproduction, but we will reshape them into something more positive and less alienated than they are today. Uh, yeah, um, first I kind of got a question about <coughs> how we explain or defend when I was going to ask about Engels and the rise of the class family arguing that the class and the family and the oppression of women is not a constant thing for human nature but something that came about through a specific moment in a period of time uh, with a change in the mode of production. Um, a couple of very young feminists that were drawn to moving through the strikes through leafleting at their colleges, they came along to the strike there and they got involved. They, they fired back a question saying, but it weren't hunter gatherers, societies kind of, you know, uh, male dominated and you know, oppressive. And they gave a list, kind of list of some like uh, uh, documentary on Sky or something like that. And, and how, <clears throat> what kind of concrete evidence facts can 
socialist, new socialist views and things, can they really <laughs> to kind of defend our ideas and provide the evidence for the fact that we say that before class society, human beings lived in much more, in terms of their relations, egalitarian than they do under class society. And um, my second point about the idea of the oppression of the family or where we want to go is, I'll, I'll just give it a strange example. I, lived, I grew up in a village um, uh, near Newmarket, and in the village I lived in a, uh, on a council estate. And um, the village had this like centenary kind of thing, which is a bit kind of fluffy, <coughs> but in my area, the working class area, people got together for the day, started discussing their problems um, and what was going on, and they had like a collective ki kitchen for the day. And mm, that was a tiny, tiny uh, glimpse into what we could create if we socialised things around communities and around workplaces. And uh, because I found in the community that different people had problems with their families, I had problems with my family, but people wanted to help, but they didn't have the time or the resources to do it. The working, working people, although they are forced into nuclear families in terms of communities, they also, they do try through human nature, through that egalitarian throwback to try and link it up to a wider coll uh, collective problem. So neighbours will discuss problems, they'll want to provide solutions, but they won't, again, they always come up against that brick wall. They don't have the time, the energy, and the resources to actually do anything about it. And uh, in terms of, you know, when we talk about the family, we should say to people who think it's really dangerous or evil to get rid of family, that we want to, in a way, take uh, some of the good elements of the family about looking after people uh, and extend that to a community thing that the community looks after people. people. The community takes the burden of looking after loved ones, of, of looking after children, of providing socialised uh, uh, kitchen, uh, socialised kitchen, that kind of stuff, and does it as a whole. And that that's much better because in many ways this nuclear family is, is quite has some serious flaws and one of the flaws is that if people die in the family which does happen the burden falls on a very small amount of people and that stress can lead to all kinds of uh, health and uh, social issues that would re reverberate but if it was a community uh, kind of uh, uh, situation in like a collective economy then that wouldn't occur because the burden will fall over everyone else uh, so in terms of when we're arguing why we think the family's uh, you know, not good enough, good enough, but what we we believe that we can replace it with, I think we have to say that we want to we want to extend the the best bits of the family and get rid of the worst bits. So yeah. Okay, we've got so just under fifteen minutes, and I've got five people who've indicated they want to speak, and we want to give Sheila some time to come back. So if you could just ask the people who are going to speak to try and be as brief as possible, so we can get everyone in. No, I have. Uh, yeah, um, <coughs> I think a lot of the question over talking to people about what we think about the family, <coughs> it, you do end up caught in a, co a, a conversation that tends to revolve around morality rather than kind of politics or economics, and it is really easy to offend people. And I think there's a lot of talk about how we might reshape the family or how we might do this or we might do that. I'm not sure it's our job as revolutionary socialists to, to kind of decide how the family should be structured in the future. I mean, I imagine around the globe, if we had a, 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 a socialist revolution that was truly international and truly socialist, um, that you um, have some people that would choose to live in communes, you'd have some people who might choose to network over a larger area through faith groups, you may have small family groups. It may be that certain areas of the earth are best conserved by um, organising people to live nomadic there, nomadically, to harvest particular resources we might need for medicine or whatever. And I, I, think, I think there's no one good way to do this. And I think the, the key thing is, is that the reason why we um, have difficulties with the family as it is now is because of the influence the state exacts over it for the goals of capitalists. I mean, that's what's wrong with the, with the family, um, not the family itself, if you like. So I think it's for the generation that grow up in a new world to decide how they would organise that. And some may still choose to live in relatively small units and provided that the needs of everybody is being met and that society can distribute resources equally, um, I, I think you could see a variety of expressions, really. And I think if we talk to people about what's possible, what's existed in history, um, and what's wrong with the family today, we, we don't necessarily need to be so condemnatory or so 
quite prescriptive. Um, I, I mean, stop me if I'm wrong when you sum up, but I, I, I think it moves us away from the morality question and into an, a world of possibilities. Um, anyway. um, I had written down a woman on the left. I don't remember who it was. Probably put your hand up a while ago. Yeah, could be anyone. Um, so then, woman on the back row. Yeah. Um, I was just wanting to sort of directly respond to the question um, from the comment in the green jumper about um, evidence of societies where um, women's oppression hasn't existed. Um, and there's a, a book that I've found really useful for examples of that, which is um, by a woman called Eleanor, Eleanor Leacock. It's called The Myths of Male Dominance. And um, in the sort of first chapter of the book, she kind of go, uh, talks a lot about the kind of, um, she sort of analyzes the writings of the people who, the Jesuits who first encountered communities in North America. And and you know and the, and the found that there there wasn't the sort of hierarchical structures and that women weren't oppressed and they noted that women were very free to engage in different sexual relationships and the rest of it and had a very kind of valued role in the society that they lived in and that actually the sort of missionaries have had a really tough time trying to get these people to you know conform to their norms of, of having having a hierarchy and 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 really dominating dominating their women and there's some like brilliant quotes in there you know um this man saying you know you you don't even know that who your son is your only son you know this is terrible a woman shouldn't be able to just sleep with whoever she wants and all the rest of it and that the the person from this community responds by saying well actually i think you're ridiculous you know you only love the children of your mm. you only love your own children but we love all of the children of our tribe and you know be, so there's some really really good good material in there yeah. so I can put Thank you. Yeah, and um, can I do the heart to endorse that? And if you want to read more, there's one of the articles I really think the SWP should reproduce is Chris Harmon's mm. article in the uh, North International Socialism Journal, which basically updates Engels's um, book on the origins of the family, private property, and the state. And that's what I want to come back to the other point that uh, Joe also spoke about when you raised that question about the transition from primitive communist society uh, to more settled agricultural communities. The point about that is that what it represented was the first opportunity in history for there to be a surplus in, in society. Because once a surplus is created, you move to a situation where you get a very precarious existence dictated by the seasons and what's available in the, the areas you're staying in. So you get very fluid sexual relations because loads of people live and die in very, very fluid circumstances and all the rest of it. But then you move to a settled agricultural community, you have a surplus, the first possibility of it. The question then arises, who controls the surplus, right? Somebody has to control the surplus. Now to some degree it doesn't matter that much who it is, but the point of the matter is somebody has to. And once you therefore have somebody in control of the surplus, they want to keep control of that surplus. And the people, for whatever reason, they see as being closest to them and the people that they want to, to be able to do that. And that's really where the family originally starts to come from. And that's what Engels goes through historically in, in the pamphlet. And, and I just really wanted to say that the thing about it is, is that that's really what we talk about when we talk about this old-fashioned thing sometimes seen as to move from the realm of necessity to the realm of freedom. Necessity is basically surviving, isn't it? And everything we all try and do, the more you have economic crisis and all the rest of it, the harder it is to survive. And therefore, the things that you have as most valuable, that sometimes seem most valuable, you cling to, even though they damage you and screw you up and all the rest of it. And the family is very, very much like that. So I think that the thing about it is, is that to look at the realm of freedom, if you like, you have to look at the possibility of living in a separate way which delivers all these things, really, instead of, in theory, instead of, you know, in dreams or aspirations or whatever, that the society that we live in is incapable of delivering on. So therefore, when we talk about you know people in the future being able to make their own practice, that's how Engels finishes The Origins of the Family. He's talking about moving from the realm of a society where we really don't have any choice of how we live into a society where we've got every possibility of really creating new possibilities of ways of living. And that's really only going to be possible once you do get control of that surplus. And therefore, you have the ability to decide what's done with it. And the basic necessity is being met for everybody means that everybody can then rise to the possibility of creating new ways of living. Thank you.
Okay, thank you. And our final contributor. Um, uh, this is a subject I feel really strongly about, um, partly because um, I'm a, an early years worker and I work in a children's centre, and children's centres are actually all about um, early years, um, so, so supporting children in their early years, but also the family. Um, and I'm, I'm a parent of a very young child who's three. And even though I've been a revolutionary for quite a long time and have had an analysis of the family and what it means for women and for, um, you know, um, capitalism, I think, you know, the actual experience of being a parent has really um, knocked, me, knocked me. And, I mean, when you, when you talk about this, how important pri privatised reproduction of, of labour under capitalism, the amount of time I spent just washing clothes, mm. cooking food, mm. nurturing, sleepless nights, mm. you know, is incredible mm. compared to when I didn't have this, mm. three, this child mm. in my life. It's a, and, mm. you know, and uh, it's completely, well, I'm not going to go down the road. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, you know, I, I live it. You live, you know, and you know you're propping up this goddamn system that oppresses you. It's a horrible thing. Um, so I, I recognise that, but um, I'm also a, a worker in this children's centre. And when you talk about how the family has changed, and how, you know how the needs of capitalism have changed, and the family has changed as well. I mean, I think it's really interesting what's going on at the moment. I'm trying to sort it all out because there's been an increase in funding for childcare over the past couple of years for three-year-olds, so they get more now than they, they yeah, do yeah, yeah. 15 hours. There's also going to be an increase for two-year-olds, you know, and, and what, what's behind it is, is actually about meeting the needs of the new workforce that under capitalism as it is at this stage, and part of that is about bringing more women out in, into the workforce. And Now, on the one hand, as a socialist, I, that's really important, um, you know, in our analysis, but actually the way capitalism is doing it is not in the best interest of the children coming in, you know. And so um, uh, what's happening to a lot of early years provision is it's, um, we, you know, we take children from 8 o'clock in the morning to 6. The toys want to finish it from 7 to 7. You know, they want our centres and to be open <coughs> all day so that parents who essentially are working shifts and all hours, because this is what will, you know, this is what it's going to mm. be like if public sector services are broken down and the private, you know, multinationals are brought in, people will be working all sorts of hours. Um, so, of course, a childcare has to be available um, uh, from these hours as well. And it's, you know, it's having a really negative impact on, on the children coming in. That's one thing. Another thing I wanted to say was about the hours then that people are working and the impact that mm. then has on the back on the mm. family. Because, you know, I have parents who some go out in the in the evening to work, come back, and then the, the another mm. goes out to work during the day. Mm. And so the children have very little interaction. Mm. And there's a big thing nationally at the moment um, that is emerging. You talk about the impact of economic change mm. and austerity and what have you, living it, Well, whereby young children coming in at three to, um, to us nationally in this country have, are having lower what we call communication language and literacy. Mm. Um, you know, they're not talking. Mm. They, they've got speech difficulties, mm. actually pronouncing words, vocabulary, sentences, you know, there's a real, real problem with it. And I think what lies behind it is the fact that parents, people aren't interacting with them mm. at home. You know, there's no, people aren't talking to them. Um, either they're not there or or when they are there, it's all very instructional. Here's your tea, get mm. your get mm. coat on, time for bed, you know, mm. all, all of these things. And, and that leads me to my question. I know you're saying they can't get rid of it, but actually the mate is being undermined all the time, you know, and but sometimes I think, how long before it collapses, and maybe it is collapsing, actually, uh, in certain parts, um, but they, don't, they either don't care about it or it's not impacting on their profits. I don't know. There's a question there. Yeah, thank you. And just quickly, uh, before Sheila comes back, um, there's tomorrow there's going to be an action supporting abortion rights as a group in uh, Bloomsbury have been targeting an abortion clinic so there's going to be some action tomorrow to support that um, 
So if you're interested, come give me your details at the end. And then she the quickly. And the closing plenary is starting sort of now downstairs. So Won't they wait for us? Oh yeah, they will. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, right. Okay. Um, Sweden is uh, a capitalist society. Had an extremely good welfare state. I don't know the detail of it, so somebody simply needs to go and get the facts on um, the facts on it. But they have a family in Sweden the same way they do, um, and have class society and a capitalist society. So it's a question of just looking at the statistics to, in order to see how 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 the thing works um, and how it's being how the you know how all the welfare me measures are being cut back and undermined in Sweden, just as they are in <coughs> in the rest of the rest of Europe. Um, that's very quickly on that. Secondly, additional reading on um, hunter-gatherer societies. Richard Lee, Colin Turnbull. I read Colin Turnbull, Turnbull's The Wayward Servant when I was 16, and that was absolute revelation to me. It sustained me for years until I kind of ran, ran, ran into Engels in the SWP um, on the question that actually men and women could and had lived equally. And, and, and so that's, that's just another one as well as Engels himself and the one that Roddy referred to and Eleanor Le Leacock. Um, I, I just want to essentially talk about this thing which I'm kicking myself now because it's actually my, my notes. That one of the central reasons for the reconstruction of the working class family inside in, 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 in the 19th century and that really has come up now in terms of what people are talking about is this. As human beings, we emerged as a, as, a, as a social species where we want relationships with other people. And part of wanting relationships with other people is also wanting to have sexual relationships with other people and also to have babies. I mean, women do want to have babies and men also want to have babies too and want to be associated with bringing up children and, 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 and taking care of children. The particularly privatised form of it means that the people are hugely socialised into the, to the notion that it's their own particular children who matter and they are the centre of their universe because people want to get, provide their children in a different future. They don't want their own children to live through what they've actually had to live through. That's very much what people tend, tend to feel. But we know from earlier societies, as, as was quoted in, in, in Eleanor Leacock, is actually given the possibilities of people you know, being in a more collective situation with children, that people actually love. Love isn't a pint pot that you, you know, you have like eight pints of blood in your veins and you have sort of eight pints of love in you. And that once you've spent it, that's it. It's, it's not, per, personal relations aren't like that. Personal relationships grow as a result of, as a result of stimulus of having personal relations. Um, and so I think we have to start off by saying that as, as Marxists, we see personal relationships of love and affection and sexual relationships as absolutely central to human existence. They are part and parcel of what we are. We are social beings. We want to talk and interact and be with people and play with one another. We want to sexually play with one another and we also want to play in all sorts of ways with one another. We want to listen to music, play music, you know, dance together, do all sorts of things together. We, you know, that is part, of, you know, that's all the kinds of things that, you know, makes us, makes us what we are. And that is part of what powered um, the reconstruction of the, of the working class family because people do want to be together. Now that also means, when I think uh, you know, Kate was expressing this and a number of other comrades, is that people are incredibly <coughs> scared of what do you do if your partner leaves you or, or if you leave them. Now in actual fact, if you talk to people who, I mean it's quite interesting, because uh, my, my dad said this to me, he said, actually, there's huge advantages to living on your own. Now, he's had, you know, lived on his own since my mum died. And he started talking about all the advantages of it because he stabilised himself with a whole network of relationships round about him and enjoys having his own house and living himself. And I talked to other friends of mine who say, well, actually, I really quite like having my own place and I can do what I like when I want to, 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 to be like. So the fear of being on your own is a consequence of the, the personal relations which are on offer to us are very, very narrowly shaped in terms, in terms of the nuclear family. Now, they are much, I think, that they, and a number of people have said it, they are much broader, the opportunities, than they were. And that's why I said I, I don't quite agree with the comrade about school. If you imagine when kids couldn't go, if, you know, no schools at all, and it was either work or nothing, I actually think the fact that kids, for all it's hierarchical and all the things that you said, 
Nevertheless, the fact that people spend 15 or 16, 20, 16 years with youngsters in an institution not having to you know go to work and then be exploited and get to know one another and do all sorts of things with another i think it's a huge benefit in terms of people having an experience of a relationship which is not constrained to the family and is not simply con necessarily constrained to the opposite sex of you know the man being superior to the woman I, I, and i do think that is uh, i do think that is in, in, important in terms of training people that other related kinds of relationships that you can be friends where else do you learn about friendships if it's not outside the nuclear, the, the, the nuclear family? And I think the school is one of the institutions that, that provides that. Now, having said that, the, the other thing that I wanted to say is, you see, I think it depends on how you pose it. If you say to people, we want to abolish a family, then they'll look at you aghast. If, however, you say, would you like to have 24-hour childcare provided so that you can actually choose to go out with whoever you like mm -hmm. to go you know, and socialise? Would, and, and good quality childcare. Would you like to, ha to, to know that there were that that eating facilities were provided, which were cheap and really, really good quality, so that you could actually go out all together. You know, you and your mates could go out together. You could go out with your children together, or your children would be safe going out together. Um, you know, without other adults, because they're in a society where all adults are actually going to be taking taking care of them. Would you like that? Um, if you begin to, would you like it if actually house, uh, housework was somehow collectivised? You know, for, for Christ's sake, we have cleaners who clean offices. Why can't we actually have, you know, cleaning, which is the cleaning of homes? It's only because we have a barrier in our heads because it's supposed to be the woman who does it inside, inside the home. Once you begin to pose it in terms of taking over and, you know, laundries. Well, I mean, the wealthy have never bloody washed a piece of clothing in, in however many <laughs> centuries, right? There have always been other people who've done it for them. Well, if you can have good quality laundries and hospitals, you know, have in the past had really good quality laundries because they needed to have clean bed linen. Why on earth can't we just have really good quality laundries for absolutely everybody? Now, once you begin to put it like that in terms of <coughs> transforming the burden of people, so people's timing, you know, you do it as part of your job. You know, somebody, obviously, people are going to be paid to do these things. But, and, it, and they have to be high status jobs, you know, that, you know, we're really proud of the people who actually do these things and they're going to be well paid. It's not a question of a servant on a low pay, honestly. When you begin to pose it like that and therefore it opens up the opportunity, you can then spend more time, not just with your own children, but perhaps as a group with other people's children. Because people actually do quite like going out with groups of children and groups of adults because everybody knows if there's a dozen, you know, if there's half a dozen adults with a dozen children, it's easier doing playing games with everybody and looking after one another than it is if there's just two of you or one of you with one kid or two kids. It's much, you know, the, the numbers actually make it, making it much, much easier. So I think it's in terms of how we, how, how, how we present the thing. And, and, and the final thing is, it will take the, the uh, if we had a revolution tomorrow, Right, and we were in control in diff you know all over Britain tomorrow. Then there are some things that we could do immediately, like we, we could immediately take over all the second homes and begin to provide people and all the hotels and things, and make sure that, that there was no homelessness and people had, had had roofs over their head. Transforming what kind of housing then gets built so it suits the needs <coughs> of people, so that you can have. Because I completely agree with the comrade at the back. The idea of living in a, in a, in you know of a, of a bigger group of you together, where you share things and, and do things collectively, um, is absolutely something that a lot of people might want to do. You might want to do it at one stage of your life and not another stage of your life. So the kind of different kinds of housing that we would want to to, to develop happens over time because you can't build them immediately. But those would be wonderful problems for all of us to be able to tackle about how we wanted to reshape society. But we'd be doing it in a context where we were doing it on the basis of actually. We are now on an equal footing. We're doing it on the basis of going forward with confidence and that we, we will make mistakes, we'll do all sorts of things wrong. People will hurt one another. I tell you, once you start you know, falling in love with different people, having different relationships with people and moving on, people will get hurt. It won't be that we'll remove pain, emotional pain in the West. It's just that, OK, but you have other relationships of solidarity, which you are already powered, part of which will keep you through the difficult times until you move on to better times in terms of personal relationships. It will take away this rigid constraint of there is only one way to do it. And if you're outside of doing that, then there's something the matter with you and you're on your own facing the world on your, on, on your own. Because actually we're a social species who are actually in it together. And when we do it all together, we do it so much better and get much more fun out of it too.